Hey guys, this is a follow-up to Ben Krasno's recent video about digital micromirror devices. I urge you to check out his video first as he uh, goes over the basics of DMD operation as well as uh, takes a DMD apart and puts it under an electron microscope to getting some really, uh, really cool images. In this video we'll look at an actual DMD uh, in operation as well as take a look at some of the modulation techniques needed to uh, produce uh, grayscale and color images as well as some of the other applications you can use uh, DMDs for other than uh, direct uh, imaging. I have to give a big shout out to my former employer Petco Design for letting me borrow this DMD board. They specialize in optical and electronics design. Let's go check them out at uh, petcodesign.com. This board is used in a product called One Light Spectra. It basically allows you to uh, download images onto the DMD over a USB connection. Uh, it's basically just on the right side a copy of the DMD uh, uh, TI DMD uh, development board example, which is just the, the DMD chip obviously, plus this uh, DAD 1000 uh, row driver. This provides high voltage drive signals. I think it's 26 volts to drive the uh, the uh, mirror switching, as well as a Xilinx FPGA, which is their effectively their chipset. They just provide a configuration ROM for it, and this. Uh, passes data from our system, the Altera FPGA, to the uh, DMD. And on this side is basically just a USB interface chip with a Cypress USB and an Altera FPGA that converts that into the format needed by the uh, DMD dev system. This particular chip is the DMD3000, which is an XGA or a 1280 or a 1024 by 768 uh, DMD. This one can refresh at up to uh, 16,000 monochrome images per second. The data is sent between the uh, devices over 32 uh, differential pairs running at about 500 megahertz. Once you've got a DMD operational, making a rudimentary projector is actually very simple. Uh, since the mirrors turn to plus and minus uh, 12 degrees, you need simply need to apply illumination at a 24 degree angle coming from the, uh, the in marking in this case at uh, 45 degrees to the uh, to the right angle of the, set of, the, of the device. So right here we've just got a, a lens. This is a rather long focal length because uh, the optical path is a little bit difficult because you, have to, you can't have the lens too close to the DMD. And in the actual projector, or most devices using these, you have a special prism that will take light in uh, basically at an angle like straight in like this, deflect it down at the right angle, and then allow the lens to be mounted close in uh, on the front. But in this case, we can just use a flashlight to illuminate it from the side. So if we turn that on and push this into the light under the lens, now if we take a look up, we can see the uh, uh, projected image there. It's not particularly bright, but it, uh, it does work, and it's pretty good resolution. It may seem so simple, but it's really cool seeing the uh, image change on a sort of DIY projector like this. And here it is from the chip side. It's so odd seeing an image uh, just change on a chip like that. It's just that's not something you normally see. Uh, the downside with this system, as it is, is that it doesn't support any sort of grayscale imaging. Uh, the image I'm displaying right now, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. Probably not due to uh, due to focusing here, but that's... Uh, let me just turn this around a bit. Yeah, this image you're seeing here is uh, an original grayscale image that was uh, dithered, just so it appears sort of uh, with some proper grayscale here. But this uh, system designed for the spectrum, uh, the spectral uh, light source doesn't, doesn't support the uh, modulation required in order to actually uh, get proper grayscale images. So how do we produce a proper grayscale image and a color image even? If we look at a typical system that has a, a light source, a color wheel, and a DMD chip, like a typical low-cost projector, uh, if we want to get 60 frames per second, the, the basic implementation would be to spin the color wheel at 60 hertz, leaving 180th of a second on each color in order to do our grayscale modulation for that color. We know on this particular DMD we can update the uh, image 16,000 uh, times per second. So if you take the so at 1 60th of a second image, divided by 3, you get 180th of a second for each color. And if you divide uh, the 16,000 by 60, you get about 266 uh, updates per 60 hertz frame. And if you divide that again by the, 
RGB, you get about 89 update, um, equally spaced updates of the mirror array per uh, color frame, 180th of a second. And if you simply turned on one of those, turn the mirrors on for one update, then off for the rest, that's not nowhere near enough uh, dynamic range to produce a proper grayscale image. For uh, eight to, to uh, reproduce 8-bit color, taking into account the gamma curve in the response to the human eye, you need about 12 bits, or one four thousandth of the uh, period, in order to get a, a proper like a pixel value of 1 displayed on the screen. If we zoom in on one of these mirror update slots and expand it, it basically consists of loading the data for the mirrors and then applying a load pulse to latch that data onto the mirrors. Basically, when you load it, it's put into SRAM cells under each mirror, and the load pulse latches that data from the SRAM cells onto the actual mirrors and changes their state. So the naive approach to modulation with this uh, setup would be just to, at the beginning of the frame, turn the mirror on for some number of pulses, some number of update periods, then turn it off for the rest of the cycle, and then, uh, and then repeat that. But obviously, again, that because of the number of the update speed, this won't work to get the desired number of grayscale colors, or gray, grayscale levels. So to get better grayscale resolution on this, we need to take advantage of uh, one of the features of the DMD hardware, and that is the ability to uh, set the mirrors and then clear them very shortly after, before we've actually had a chance to reload uh, new data into them. So this is showing one period across here is the one 180th of a second, the, uh, the each color period. So we've kept, for most of the time, the normal PW, PWM approach, where you have one a high pulse for some certain amount of time each uh, period. But on the end, we've added, in this case, four shorter uh, pulses where we'll take advantage of that set and clear hardware. So I've taken this area, we've zoomed it out here. In this diagram, D represents the uh, data being loaded onto all of the mirrors, the entire array. The load pulse goes high to, to move the data from the SRAM cells behind the, ele the pixel elements into the, uh, into the mirrors, to set the mirrors. The reset pulse can be uh, driven high to clear all the mirrors back to the off state. And, uh, and this, the mirror just represents the value of one particular mirror we're looking at out of the entire array, just as an example. What you basically do is load the data into the DMD, uh, supply a load pulse to set the mirrors, and then instead of having to wait the whole data load period to, read, to load new values, we'll clear them halfway through. So we've now produced a pulse that's uh, half the width that we have with PWM control. So that effectively gets us one more bit of resolution. And we continue this, so each set, each um, uh, mirror load period is 62.5 microseconds. So now we've produced a pulse. We can either turn it on or not turn it on to produce a 31.25 microsecond pulse. And then we repeat this. So while this pulse is going on, we're loading the data for the next, uh, the next pulse. And this can, uh, we then uh, set, load this new, pulse, new uh, data in. And this time we clear it after half of that 31.25 microseconds, or about 15, 16 microseconds. And that produces another, this gives us another bit of resolution. And we repeat this with shorter and shorter pulse widths, each pulse adding one more uh, bit of resolution. Now we get into a problem uh, at the end here. Uh, you might ask why we don't just add uh, six pulses up here and get all the 12 bits we need right away. The problem is the mirrors in the DMD take a few microseconds to move, so your pulse widths are limited to something in the order of five microseconds, or that range. It, the exact limit depends on the particular DMD hardware you're using. So we've reached this limit now where we have about 10 bits and we wanted 12. 10 bits always gets you about 1,000 uh, grayscale levels, which is good but not uh, quite perfect. We want to get all the way to be able to display a full, uh, a full, the full range. To get the last two bits of resolution, you have to add another approach, such as dithering. And most projectors use a uh, temporal dithering approach, which means that uh, unlike a static dithering shown here, where, where you can see all of the different uh, uh, on and off values very, uh, very easily, you uh, basically change the seed for the dither each uh, frame, so it's sort, of, it's sort of random, it changes in time. 
So if we take an example here of uh, four pixels, we want them to have them to have a value of one quarter. So at any one, on average, each pixel is on one quarter of the time. So in this case, uh, for the first, for, these are the number of uh, frames here, like the first frame, second frame, etc. These are the pixel. These are the each pixel. So on the first frame, frame pixel one would be on. The second frame, in this example, for example, pixel four. Then the next frame, pixel three. Then pixel two. And since this is moving, going at a high frame rate, like 60 frames per second, your eye doesn't really perceive this uh, dither. It just perceives it generally as a as a static uh, image. And in this case, uh, if you wanted, for example, here we have a minimum pulse width of four microseconds. If you wanted an average pulse width of one, you would do a dither like this. Now, even though this dither is used uh, all throughout the frame, it's only really apparent at very low brightness levels. If you have a TV that uses this, like a DLP projector, or a uh, uh, most plasma displays also use this type of dither because they operate in a similar mode of being able to turn on and off all the pixels at once. Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately I don't have a, uh, an actual DLP projector to show you this, but I'll take a look at the, I do have a plasma TV, I'll take a look at that on the high-speed camera and we can see uh, what this dither looks like. Okay, I'll show you an area right here between the A and the N, that way we get the uh, white of the text and the very low, low end, low level uh, uh, sort of dark gray on the screen. In fact, you can see some of the uh, modulation, random modulation right there. Anyway, I'll do this recording. This is going to be at about 14,500 frames per second, so we can actually see how this is uh, driven. Scrolling through this video, we can clearly see uh, the flashes as it flashes on each... Uh, I don't know what you would call them. Uh, I think plasma, in plasma TVs, they call these subfields, where it does each uh, sort of subframe with its uh, dithering. As we go through, we can see they get uh, brighter and brighter as we go. Uh, the, the later modulation in this seems to be quite different from the one I'm the solution I'm showing here, but uh, the plasma display is quite different. It doesn't have quite as uh, as fast a refresh as the uh, DMD does. Nowhere near as as uh, fast. So uh, in the plasma case, what they're probably doing is uh, having more of these short pulses, or just making the entire thing out of these variable width. Uh, uh, pulses instead of the, having any sort of a PWM segment. Yes, yeah, so and if we if we compare these uh, dithered frames, I'll show one from the uh, current frame, one from the next, and the next, and the next. We can hopefully see that they're uh, uh, different each frame, even though the pattern it's trying it's producing is uh, should be uh, constant. In real projectors, they make a few changes to this modulation system. Uh, the most common, uh, because projector manufacturers want to be able to advertise the highest brightness possible, the most common thing they do is add a white segment to the color wheel. And since the color filter segments absorb about two-thirds of the light going through them, adding this white can, even a small white segment, like one quarter, can just about double the brightness of the projector. The problem there is this only works for white parts of the image. This is good for something like a presentation. If you're projecting a spreadsheet, for example, it's all white. But if you're trying to project a movie, this does not help and just makes the image look bad. So if your projector has a feature such as white boost or brilliant white or bright white or something like that, if you care what image quality, turn that off. And that basically just disables the DMD when it's on the white section. And if you want to increase contrast ratio, people actually go in and black out the the uh, white segment with a marker because any light that is getting through when the DMD is off that st still impacts the contrast ratio because the DMD leaks a little bit of light. And because as you cycle through the colors here, the uh, if you pan your eye across you'll get sort of a uh, like a street camera effect. You'll see the, these the, rainbow, the famous rainbows from DMDs. So what they often do is run this instead of running this wheel at 60 hertz, if you're, projecting, if you're projecting an image at 60 hertz, you won't spin the wheel at 60 rotations per second, you'll spin it at some multiple, like 120 or 180 rotations per second. So that will make the color cycle faster and make this uh, rainbow problem not so pronounced. The problem with that is then, if you, in your modulation scheme, you now have much less time, so you, uh, you might have much less resolution, so you have to add more of these short pulses and more dithering to compensate for that. If you see this is this diagram shows one 
sixtieth of a second with the normal RGB, you can see the time. If you add white, you compress those somewhat. And if you double the wheel speed, you compress them much more significantly. So as you trade off the rainbows, you get worse uh, color or grayscale reproduction. There are several applications for DMDs outside of just displaying an image. Uh, this is an image from a TI uh, paper. This is about a DLP uh, spectroscopy device. This is basically what they have in the, uh, the device that the DMD board I showed earlier was out of, the uh, one, light, uh, one light spectra device. Uh, it basically consists of a light bulb and collimator that focuses it onto a slit. Uh, the light goes in, then goes through a diffraction grating which breaks it up into different wavelengths falling on different parts of the DMD. And then by turning different columns on you can select exactly which wavelength or combination of wavelengths and how intense they are uh, for the light, the light that comes out of the device. So you can produce any uh, spectrum of light that you want, which is much more advanced than simply an RGB uh, LED or similar. This is used in a lot of scientific applications, for example in, uh, for microscopes, where you can scan through the, all the different wavelengths taking monochrome images and get a full spectra of the transmission, transmittance of your uh, sample. You could also use it to take uh, photographs, again by exposing different wavelengths of light, uh, say taking monochrome photographs with different uh, illumination wavelengths, you can create a full uh, image that is records all this, the full spectral characteristics of the thing you're looking at. Another big application for DMDs is in 3D printers, in this case for uh, SLA type 3D printers, where they basically uh, scan the image onto the photosensitive resin uh, frame by frame to, in, order to, in order to build up 3D print. Although this method, I believe, is patented by uh, some of the major 3D printer uh, manufacturers, so no one, uh, no one really uses DMDs in low-cost 3D printers. Although there have been some attempts to make low-cost ones using a simple, normal uh, projector, DLP projector, to project the image onto the uh, surface for a, to make a 3D printer. If anyone can think of any interesting projects to do with this uh, DMD board while I have it, uh, let me know. I'm sure there's some interesting stuff that could be done. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, DMD, go check out uh, TI's website. There's a lot of interesting application notes and uh, data sheets and white papers, etc. On, the, uh, on these chips and their controllers and everything. Anyway, hope you found this video on digital micromirror devices interesting. Thanks for watching.